I am pleased to announce that exactly 100 hours since ground operations commenced and six weeks since the start of Operation Desert Storm, all United States and coalition forces will suspend offensive combat operations. On February 28, 1991, then U.S. President George Bush announced the end of operations to liberate Kuwait, a war that involved 34 countries to free Kuwait from the occupation of the Ba'athist regime of Iraq. Thousands of American troops returned home to a hero's welcome after the president's announcement. However, this wasn't the end of the story. Only a few years later, news of unfamiliar diseases afflicting these veterans and their newborn children made headlines drawing the attention of the American society. New theories were raised by the U.S. Army. There were speculations about the use of anthrax vaccines by the soldiers as an antidote against the probable use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein. The use of combat uniforms impregnated with different chemicals to protect soldiers against desert insects. And the inhalation of fumes from the burning oil fields of Kuwait. But what undermined these assumptions was that the people of Iraq particularly the citizens of Basra, experienced the same symptoms as American troops did. And yet, they were relatively far from the oil fields, were not injected with anthrax, and did not wear clothes smeared with insect repellents. For this reason, another notion emerged. The unknown diseases had to be somehow related to events that took place in the vicinity of fighting, where both soldiers and ordinary civilians were located. They had difficulty controlling their temperature, they had uh, uh, sweating attacks at night, they had loss of memory, they had um, gait problems so they would fall over, um, their eyesight would go very peculiar, they had a lot of diarrhea, they, um, uh, basically these were all effects ultimately associated with the housekeeping properties of the lower brain. There was nothing that any doctors could do about it, so they, they kind of put it down to some kind of uh, um, post-war stress phenomenon. Since we have also got studies that we have done and others have done showing increases in congenital malformation in the people living on the battlefield or in areas where the, the material was used, the most likely thing, or at least that scientifically, what they have in common is the exposure to the materials that the soldiers were using at the time of the battle. So then you have to decide on what materi material that, were, that they were using that could cause congenital malformation and cancer. 
there is only depleted uranium. To find the answer, we travel to the UK, a country that is among the users of depleted uranium and constantly opposes all studies on the consequences of such weapons. We met with an expert and researcher in this field, Professor Chris Busby, a British physicist and one of the most famous researchers in the field of depleted uranium. Huh. Right. Okay. This is a sample from a bomb crater from Gaza. What is depleted uranium? Um, well, depleted uranium is uh, a waste product of the nuclear industry, uh, of the processing of uranium to create substances which can be used as nuclear fuels in reactors or, or enriched uranium in, in weapons, in, in atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs. Uranium is an element extracted in the form of stone from mines. Its isotopes are separated through centrifuges during a very complex and costly procedure. In this process, a large amount of depleted uranium, considered as waste material, is produced. This means that for each kilogram of enriched uranium, seven kilos of depleted uranium is produced. Di Williams, a researcher in military and security affairs, has studied the consequences of using weapons equipped with uranium. Uranium as a, as a, as a metal is, is unusual. It, it's very heavy. It's as heavy as, as, as lead. No, it's twice as heavy as lead, nearly. It's as, it's as heavy as gold. Um, it's extremely dense, so if you pick up a piece of uranium from the battlefield, which I have done, you find you th it, it feels like it sticks to, stuck to the ground because it's so heavy. So you pick up, I mean, an, an, an apple of depleted uranium would weigh 10 kilograms. The unusual issue about uranium combustion is that when it starts to burn, it creates one of the hottest fires on Earth. Its temperature may even reach up to 5,000 degrees centigrade and lead to a nuclear explosion. In the 70s, scientists realized that depleted uranium could be useful even without explosion, because it was very heavy and burnt at a very high temperature. Since the Second World War, tungsten bullets have been used to pierce armors. However, tungsten is a very expensive metal, and if the armor is very thick, it fails to penetrate it. What they needed is uh, a metal in their, ammunition, in their ammunition, which was capable to penetrate the armor of the Russian tanks. We went to Utrecht in the Netherlands to see an expert in military armaments to inquire about the environmental impact of using depleted uranium weapons. For several years, Vin Zinnenberg has handled military and security issues at the ICAF Pax Christi Institute. He's traveled many times to the contaminated zones of Iraq and has written important articles on the subject. Especially in the West, there was a, the people were the, the governments were afraid of Soviet tanks, and they were expecting there will be main battles battles being fought on, on the German highlands against uh, um, against the Russian tanks. So they start developing um, armored piercing ammunitions that would be capable to defeat the Russian tanks. When the uranium bullet hits the tank, the front of the bullet begins to burn. And it burns, as I said, it burns so hot that it burns a hole through the armor plate. And this is the difference between tungsten and uranium. So the bullet doesn't go bang. It's actually a penetrator, just like shooting a lead bullet. So, but the, the difference is that it's pyrophoric uh, and, and the energy uh, of impact causes it to burn. When you fire the U on the armored target, it will have a self-sharpening effect. So the, it will leave a small hole in the tank, for example, and it, inside the tank it will create, because it's highly the, inflammable, it's uh, pyrophoric, it gives a sort of pyrophoric effect, it will create a lot of heat inside the tank as well, destroying everything inside the tank. And it, it easily penetrates the armor again at the other side, so it will basically destroy the tank very easily. 
Bombs containing depleted uranium have a very high destructive power. Compared to other arms, their production is very cheap because depleted uranium is a byproduct, and in some way, it's the waste from the nuclear fuel cycle, which is obtained at almost no cost at all. Therefore, these bombs are very cheap and extremely effective weapons. All metals are toxic to some degree, even aluminium. However, heavy metals have higher toxicity. It means the heavier the metal, the more toxic it would be. Uranium has the highest atomic number among all elements and is one of the heaviest natural elements on Earth. With an atomic number of 92, this metal has the highest property to absorb and stop X-ray compared to others. If a small amount of this element was in your body, all the X and gamma rays that would otherwise pass through your body would be absorbed by it. If you have any uranium inside you, it, it acts as a little antenna for, for gamma radiation from the environment. And this has nothing to do with its own radioactivity, it's just because it has a high atomic number, like lead. Now the other problem, that we, we, unlike lead, is that it binds to DNA. Since 1960s, it's been known that uranium has an enormously high chemical affinity for, for DNA. And DNA is the target of all radiation effects. So if you get sick, if you get cancer, if you get some disease after radiation, it's because the DNA in your cells has been damaged. Uranium got a substance with two properties. One, it stops, it stops back natural background radiation and it converts it into local photoelectrons. Two, it does so on the DNA. So this, is, this makes it particularly uh, and interestingly dangerous. If a tank is hit by a uranium bullet and is set on fire, it would be surrounded with a column of smoke. Some part of this smoke would contain depleted uranium particles, which will remain in the soil for many years. These particles are propagated by wind and enter the lungs of people who have returned to their homes and neighborhoods after the war. So these substances are essentially a gas and they float around all over the place. They can go through the skin, they can go through the na nasal passages into the, into the brain. They can, but basically there's no respirator that will keep them out. The diameter of these particles on average is 100 nanometers or one-tenth of a micron. Therefore, no filter can prevent these particles from entering the human respiratory tracts. On the other hand, uranium particles emit alpha rays, and when they enter the human body, they inflict irreparable damage on it. These matters can be transferred to the couple's fetus, causing defects, strange deformities, and incurable diseases in the infant. There are witnesses confirming the unusual rise in cancer cases reported among children. Depleted uranium can destroy cells and cause different types of cancers and increase the birth of deformed babies. According to statistics, many children born after the first Persian Gulf War and the years after it were affected with leukemia. You get a scrambling of the genes between generations. So what happens is that the cells themselves suddenly switch on this mechanism and start to create automatic genetic damage. It means that in terms of the uranium weapons, that what's happened is that they have switched on, they've thrown a switch in the populations that have been exposed, which will probably result in them in having increased rates of congenital malformation and cancer for many generations, many generations, and that's even if you took all the uranium away tomorrow. Well, the half-life of uranium is very, very long. It's 4.7 times 10 to the 9 years. 10 to the 9 is a billion years, a million, a thousand million years. And so that's the half-life of uranium. So essentially, it's there forever. Depleted is a very clever way of making people think that uranium weapons are safe. They're not. After one week of extensive efforts in Iraq, we succeeded in obtaining the permit to interview experts of the Basra Department of Health and Medical Treatment. We set out from Baghdad towards the southern deserts and traveled on a trail of 500 kilometers.
Wherever you step in Iraq, you will find a living war museum. Iraq has experienced 40 years of war, unrest and military coups. Today, two decades after the Kuwait war, one still finds wreckages of those years along southbound roads. Demolished steel abandoned in the desert and at times within the reach of children or other people. These are remnants of the Kuwait war, a war that still takes victims. 1,800 square kilometers of the southern Iraqi soil are contaminated with depleted uranium. These particles are spread all over surrounding areas by the wind. After the end of the war, people started to return to their homes and neighborhoods while uranium particles entered their bodies through respiration. This is the biggest and the most enduring consequence of using depleted uranium in war. In 1991, the Ba'ath army invaded the small but rich country of Kuwait. Saddam had a notorious record of atrocious crimes. Two years earlier, and near the end of his war against Iran, when he used chemical weapons against his own people, he had demonstrated his ruthlessness. However, the silence of the world community made him bolder, and he decided to occupy Kuwait. Of course, this time his old allies were no longer keen on maintaining silence because there was the issue of oil and energy at stake. So it was decided to put a halt on his ambitions. This will not stand, this aggression against uh, Kuwait. What has happened is a total violation of international law. Please raise their hand. In the shortest possible time, close to one million soldiers from the combined armies of 34 allied countries attacked Iraq a coalition composed of land, sea and air forces, unprecedented since the Second World War. In this war, the latest weaponry was used against the Iraqi army. They were weapons that were never tested before. A-10 warplanes severely attacked thousands of fleeing Iraqi armor carriers and vehicles. A-10 is one of the deadliest warplanes and has been dubbed as the tank hunter. It uses depleted uranium ammunition to destroy tanks. The very large 30mm cannon on board this plane can fire 3,900 bullets in each minute. With this, no target can feel secure in confronting it. The use of this warplane during the Kuwait War left a deadly trail. Hundreds of fleeing and retreating tanks and armored vehicles were targeted by this plane to such an extent that the trail of retreat came to be known as the Death Trail. The impacts of these depleted uranium bullets in the southern parts of Iraq and particularly in the province of Basra, are still visible. My name is Naomi Toyoda. I'm a photojournalist. I have been in Iraq before Gulf War. No, this is a big children, but after five years, so 1995, I saw some news about uh, Gulf War syndrome from U U.S. So, of course, I surprised what happened it was, it is in U.S., also Iraq, because, you know, so they used to depleted the uranium in Iraq. I met uh, many kids patients as a leukemia, or they had a leukemia or cancer. Of course, I shocked. Most of picture of these books is a final picture of these kids because most of kids already dead. You see, he's uh, yeah. 
very thin skin. And also, I couldn't forget about her. I met grandmother of her. This is in Basra city. Before one year ago, taking pictures, the grandmother showed me this picture. She was the, just a normal kid. But now she is. And grandmother anger me. We don't need a picture. We need medicine, she said. So she said, I don't need this. I need medicine. I need medicine. I need medicine to my children. I need to save my children. In Basra, we visited Dr. Javad Al Ali, one of the most famous oncologists in Basra. In Sadr Hospital, many patients were waiting for the arrival of Dr. Al Ali and his colleagues. In Basra, I worked um, since 1970 or 69, 70. That's mean for 40 years or more than 40 years I am working here. I haven't seen a large number of cancers in the hospitals, except after the uh, 1991 war, by four or five years. We studied the cases, and we found a very strange phenomena. Many members of the same family affected by cancers. Certain patients have more than one cancer. We see that leukemia appears first and children are more affected. We see so many cases of the congenital anomalies among infants, among newborn, and uh, the number of the cases increased in 1995. And most of the cases is leukemia, leukemia and brain tumor. The newly built pediatric hospital in Basra is another location bearing witness to the pains and sufferings of Iraqi children. So when we saw the first one, this is about 4 years ago, we took the chemo, we didn't get the chemo, we saw the second one before 7 years. And we saw it behind, it was an important place to see the second one. Yes. I treat the cancer patients before 99 and I met only 15 cases all over the years about cases of cancer. But if you ask me about now the number of the cases, about the new cases, about more than 200 cases per year. The other thing which we noticed that we have an increased incidence of birth defects. Ministry of the Health is not allow anyone to give the exact number, but I will can give you the roughly about the cases increase about three, four, or three times than before. Yes.
وقال أن هذه الزيادة في الأعداد السرطانية هي نتيجة الحروب التي حدثت في المنطقة وتأثيراتها أنا أعتقد أن هناك علاقة أعتقد من وجهة نظر شخصية هو مجرد اعتقاد أن السرطانة التي كانت أنواعها تحدث في العراق سابقا بدأت تختلف أنواعها لكن لا أمتلك من الدليل العلمي لكي أؤكد هذه المعلومة لكن هناك علاقة أعتقد أن هناك علاقة فأنا أعتقد أنه وجود هذه الأعداد في البصرة حصرا نتيجة هذه ممكن أن تكون هناك علاقة وأعتقد سوف تكون هناك علاقة بالمستقبل توقعات Even after talking to the highest authority in Iraq's Ministry of Health we came out empty handed It's very politically sensitive in Iraq because the, Amer the Americans still have quite some influence on the Iraqi government um, and it's quite obvious from our meetings that the Iraqis are not too keen or the Iraqi government to um, put, put too much focus on this. Amer like, uh, Iraqis are now slowly recovering from armed conflict and they're trying to attract more investors um, from different regions and too much negative attention on, on the fact that there is contamination of depleted uranium and the potential causes of that would scare away potential investors. So we noticed that it's uh, less of a priority for them. The United States, as the largest producer and user of this type of uranium bullets, has taken a conflicting and contradictory stance on the issue by denying its use, dampling its destructive consequences, and easily refuting its impact on the environment, humans, and even its own soldiers. We have looked at some 90 Gulf War veterans who were in or on armored vehicle when it was struck by depleted uranium and friendly fire. Our people who were in or on the vehicles that were struck in friendly fire did inhale that oxide, and we've not seen any medical consequence from that. They certainly had the highest dose exposure of anybody in the Gulf War. I did some small research on military manuals that are being put in place by different uh, armies, both from the US, from the UK, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, from NATO, to prevent their troops from being exposed to, to depleted uranium. And they have all kinds of specific um, uh, regulations for the troops. So they say they tell the troops, okay, um, if you come across a burning tank which is likely hit with depleted uranium, stay away from the tank, uh, don't approach it. If you have to approach it, you have to put on a mask. If you return to base, you have to wash your hands, you have to wash your, your shoes, you have to wash your, your, um, your clothes. Um, so there are all kinds of specific measures being taken to prevent them from getting sick. So they acknowledge to a certain extent there is a potential effect. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax, but UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters. Of course, lied in the Security Council, and he knew he was lying in the Security Council. Everybody knew he was lying, but they wanted this war so badly uh, that they wanted a justification at any cost, at any price. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. Despite efforts made by all anti-war groups and organizations throughout the world, the war against Iraq was launched on March 2003. It was a war to disarm Iraq of weapons of mass destruction, which were presented by the West to Saddam years before. The majority of these weapons had been destroyed in the 90s under careful scrutiny and the deadly sanctions of the UN Security Council. Of course, we, we knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction. 
those weapons were all found and destroyed um, by the weapon inspectors uh, during the sanctions. And all, already in 2005, the report of uh, the weapon inspectors said that 95% of all the weapons of, uh, that they have found, the weapon cache, the weapons that, that Iraq uh, possessed, were destroyed. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. In this war, not only depleted uranium, but all types of different weapons were used. After the Kuwait War, the United States had produced new generations of laser-guided missiles to destroy targets and fortifications constructed deep underground, which were dubbed as bunker busters. In 2003, the US Air Force made extensive use of these bombs during the attacks on Iraqi positions. However, this scale of destruction required a substance that was quite different from the warheads on other missiles. After Saddam's downfall, U.S. forces closed down many civilian centers such as schools and brought them under their occupation. To reopen their schools, the citizens of Fallujah organized many protests. During these events, 17 demonstrators were killed by U.S. troops. In retaliation, the Fallujah militia killed four U.S. soldiers, leading to a harsh revenge by the U.S. Army. The citizens are still paying the price. Fallujah is like a, a case of almost uh, an Iraq war again in miniature exercised upon a small town. Uh, it involved a siege, um, it involved some quite unconscionable rules uh, allowing for example at one point during that siege uh, women and children to leave the city but every single male who was of military age was assumed to be a military man and was forced to stay in the city. There were two attacks on Fallujah. There was an attack in April and then there was another, another attack in November, December. And both were incredibly violent and both were things that, uh, to my mind, are amongst the worst acts that have occurred during the entire period. And uh, I suppose one of the bitter ironies of it is that instead of crushing any kind of resistance or insurgency, they actually seem to have uh, stimulated. reports, 70% of the city's buildings were completely destroyed and hundreds of civilians were killed during this attack. But the damages sustained by this small city did not end here. When we were looking at um, the population of Fallujah, we actually found the uranium in the hair of the parents of the children with congenital malformations. Now, in my opinion, that, that's as, as, as close you can, as you're going to get to a smoking gun. They just destroyed Fallujah and put all these weapons there 
to find out what the effects were on the people. It cannot be denied. There have been scientific studies, but these studies have been done by independent people. I think we were the first Western organization to really investigate this issue on an epidemiological level. And so in, in 2009, we sent a team of teams of people around Fallujah to ask questions. And we did an epidemiological questionnaire study, which showed that the increases in cancer there were astronomical. They were higher than the levels of cancer that you found after the Hiroshima bombing. We had levels of leukemia in young people under the age of 34 of 38 times the expected number based on the Egyptian cancer registry. We had increases in breast cancer in women of about tenfold, and there was a ca childhood cancer increase of 14-fold. And the extraordinary thing, you know, for me, is that nobody believed us because the levels of cancer were so large. So they said these levels of cancer were so large it's impossible. So it's some, they must have made it up. It can't be true. Some guy comes along and says, well, here's, I've got an experiment. Like, here's an experimental laboratory, Fallujah. Only one thing happened in Fallujah, uranium. That's all, okay? Well, you can come along and say, oh, well, no, it might have been the white phosphorus or it might have been something else or whatever. But whatever it is, it's like a very small laboratory. The war ends, but the bitter story starts when people return to their homes in war-ravaged areas. These are regions that have become contaminated through the extensive use of depleted uranium. Children play in tanks, left behind from the days of fighting, unaware of the risks. Like we see in Iraq, there are so many tanks left behind, even in civilian areas. What's happening with these tanks? People try to recycle because they are poor, it's a war uh, situation, they like to make some money and the contaminated tanks will be recycled and come into the communities and be a danger again for the civilians. What did I see when I was touring around of Baghdad? I saw many places with destroyed Iraqi tanks and armed personnel carriers, which has been told to me that most of these probably will have been destroyed with depleted uranium. And what do I see? Shortly after the, 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 the overthrow of the Saddam regime, I see there is not taking any measure of precaution it means there has not been fences or surrounding things by putting hazardous signs or watch out, don't come here, nothing at all. So little children were playing on these tanks, climbing inside these tanks, playing in the sand around these tanks, so they were fully exposed to the dust with depleted uranium. When I returned in 2004 to some of these places, I saw most of these tanks were removed. But what did I see? People were cultivating vegetables there. So in a place where the soil, well, the earth has not been removed. So that means there is a big chance that inside that vegetables is depleted uranium. In 1973, a war broke out between Israel and the Egyptian and Syrian armies, which came to be known as the Yom Kippur, or the October War. The initial results of the war were in favor of the Arab armies, and its continuation could seriously upset regional balance. 
In the meantime, Goldemeyer, the Israeli premier, sought the urgent assistance of the United States. A shipment of different aid was sent to Israel. It included weapons that were never used previously in any war. During the land battle between the party's tanks, Egyptian units sustained heavy damages. Ultimately, about 260 Egyptian tanks were destroyed in the Sinai Desert. The depleted uranium ammunitions had gloriously passed their first test, but this was not the last time that they were to be used. 43 years later, on the 12th of July 2006, with the pretext of liberating two soldiers from the hands of Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Israeli army declared an all-out war against this country and used the latest military equipment during this unequal battle. The New York Times published a report revealing the Bush administration's agreement to an immediate supply of 100 bunker buster missiles to the Israeli army. These missiles were meant to destroy important targets such as the Hezbollah command headquarters and their missile launching platforms. Their destructive power was very high and it was suspected their warheads carried a special substance. When the attack happened in Lebanon in 2006, um, I had a call from a, a, a newspaper in Lebanon to say that somebody had found a radioactive crater in Khriam in South Lebanon. Dr. Kabesi, a Lebanese physicist, and his British colleagues carried out tests and experiments on the destroyed regions only weeks after the end of the war. I went to the south of Lebanon and was shown the crater which had... The research was done by a, a, a Lebanese physicist um, who is an expert on radiation and he, he had a Geiger counter and in the bottom of the crater the radiation level was 20 times higher than it was outside the crater. All these houses were simply uh, on the ground. Here we found the uh, radiation. That area here was a huge, huge uh, hole and this was kaput, nothing was left at all. I think they built a new, new place. Uh, everything that you show us in the report is, uh, came from here. That's, yes. This is where the hole was, was water, has water, you remember? And the water pipe comes from along this, this place, the mm -hmm. pipe for the municipality. And the pipe broke down, and then flew, the water flew down okay. to the crater. As you know, the, the uh, war against Iraq at that time, and we could see the type of explosion there. That, so this type of explosion I saw in the films or uh, in the news, uh, similarly, the type of weapons was used in, uh, in, in Lebanon uh, by the Israelis. That, that gave me the, the suspicion that they, have, they, they are using really uh, weapons which were uh, missiles equipped with uh, uh, some type of, some type of uh, uranium. Uh, when you see some story, a building, a story of eight, eight stories and you hit it from the top, top. then the missile will go simply, simply, simply down like, like a butter. <laughs> I came back to England and six weeks later we had these samples tested. Dr. Busby arranged and they were tested by the Harwell Laboratory in, in Oxfordshire which is a very famous atomic testing laboratory. We had it done in two separate laboratories. We had the same sample, we split the sample, we sent one to Harwell where, it was where they used ICP uh, mass spectrometry. The other half we sent to David Assender in North Wales and he uses alpha spectrometry, totally different technique and they both gave the same answer, about 110. 
Uh, 110 means it's enriched uranium. Now, enriched uranium does not exist in nature. It, it, it's only found in nuclear plants or, or in bombs or, in, or, or it's man-made. Later on, on my way back, I went to South Beirut. There was a, an ambulance which had been destroyed in the bombing, but before it had been destroyed, it had been for two weeks, it had been driving through all the bomb areas. And so I asked if I could have the air filter from the ambulance. And I took the air filter with me back to England for testing. And when the air filter t was tested, this also had uranium contamination in it. And it was also low enriched uranium contamination, like the contamination in the soil in Korea. The United Nations report from Lebanon had one page on this testing in, for, for Lebanon and, and no details. And the, the details they had were completely inconsistent with the laboratory results. Now they took away the laboratory results, but I have them. The samples which we took were low enriched from the air filter in Beirut and from the craters there. So it's very serious to say that the United Nations Environment Programme report in 2007 for Lebanon hid the true results of their test. When we published these reports, there was a big denial about it. We then went to Berlin to talk to Professor Manfred Muher, a lecturer on international law. He specializes in international human rights laws, or IHL. Professor Muha is a senior legal member in a number of European anti-war organizations and campaigns and is active in legal aspects of issues related to banned weapons. There was a question whether DU weapons are illegal or not. So I oh yeah, got involved in this debate uh, and uh, just checking the legality of DU weapons. And as an expert of international humanitarian, humanitarian law, it, it's become quite clear from the very beginning there is no explicit prohibition of DU weapons. But you can argue with IHL. You can look into the Geneva Conventions, uh, additional protocols to Geneva Conventions, and you see certain principles. The underlying rationale of IHL is to distinguish between two groups, the military and the civilians. In fact, this part of a set of rules called the Principles of Differentiation states that in any war, one may attack combatants, soldiers, military equipment and the like, but ordinary civilians should not be subjected to any active hostility. According to this essential principle, the conflicting groups and armies engaged in war must distinguish and differentiate between these two groups. However, there are times when weapons such as depleted uranium are used which, in addition to affecting their targets, have a negative impact on future generations after the end of the war. We say, well, in this case, we have to apply the precautionary principle, which is a principle that says, if you're not sure about the risk, and there are certain risks with people, but you're not sure about um, the effects, then you should apply the precautionary people, uh, principle and make sure that people are not exposed to this and um, that prevents them from being contaminated and getting sick. Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICSC, has defined what is the meaning of the precautionary principle in relation to the environment. And there's a rule, uh, they numbered the rules, customary legal rules, uh, Rule 44, saying, uh, as the ICSC sees it, you have to be precaution, cautious with relation to the environment. So take precautions not to attack the environment with your weapons. The other rule in the principles of differentiation states that impacts of weapons applied during the war must be controlled. But unfortunately, the effects of depleted uranium cannot be controlled because they endure for millions of years. 
In another part of the principles, it is stipulated that if a particular weapon causes excessive wounds, its use should be banned. For instance, if after a war, soldiers or their families fall sick to contamination caused by ammunitions, these damages are considered to be excessive and the use of such weapons are banned. However, the notable rule of the principles of differentiation is the principle of caution. This principle states that if it remains to be seen whether a particular weapon causes excessive impacts, the principle of caution must be respected and its use should be banned. Despite all these principles and emphasis, and despite the fact that the excessive damages of depleted uranium weapons are quite obvious, their application is still not banned, and they are still used in wars. In terms of the UN interest, there have been three international resolutions now. Uh, the first in 2007, which recognised the potential health risks from DU. The second in 2008, which called for international agencies to do further studies on the impact of DU in affected states. And then in 2010, a resolution was supported by 148 states to four. Uh, which called for the users of DU munitions to transfer data on where they've been used and what quantities. New York, the headquarters of the United Nations. Each day, new and different issues, resolutions and decisions are raised and approved by member countries, including a resolution that was put to vote for the fourth time on the 3rd of December 2012. It was a resolution to draw attention to the consequences of using depleted uranium weapons. The Assembly is now voting on draft resolution 7. The resolution states that countries which have used these weapons during different conflicts must provide information on the geographical scope and the extent of their application in each region in order to enable the process of their decontamination. The voting has been completed, the machine is locked. The result of the vote is as follows. In favor, 155. Opposed, 4. Abstentions, 27. Draft Resolution 7 is adopted. The only negative votes to this resolution were cast by the United States, Britain, France and Israel, which have common interest in the production and use of such weapons. The point is that UN General Assembly resolutions are non-binding and they are only meant to increase emphasis on a particular issue. The approval of this resolution by most member states shows that the world community is deeply concerned. Eighty-five percent of all the weapons that are used and produced in this world come from countries that are inside the United Nations Security Council. Corporations will do everything to put pressure on governments. Governments and corporations will do everything to put pressure on the media to keep this subject as covered as possible. Uh, we must not forget that 29% of all the workforce in America is working in one way or another for the military industrial complex. So, if they cannot sell those weapons or in, if they cannot use those weapons or if they cannot do that research into creating new weapons, or, uh, then, you know, they, they, their economy collapses. So, America is a war economy. They need war. In terms of the actual work towards a ban, it can be quite difficult to ban these weapons. It depends on the international politics at the time. Uh, we face some challenges in that the, those countries that use the weapons see a military need for them and will fight tooth and nail to avoid removing them from their armies. Do we have to 
to specify for for every uh, new weapon or or version of, of a weapon that is being used uh, do we have to create a new law I I don't think so the, the, the problem is, is is deeper the problem is the unwillingness of, of the great powers to comply to to the the laws that they have themselves have drafted uh, after the Second World War. The best thing would be to have a convention, a treaty on depleted uranium weapons, um, banning the EU weapons forever. Like we have treaties on chemical weapons, on bacteriological weapons, we have treaties on um, cluster munition, on landmines, that kind of would be the perfect solution to it.